the technique for finding the integral, the double integral by hand, is to do something called iterated integral. So the, the, the notation I used before for the double integral was this. What we're going to introduce now is something that looks like this. b to c to d of f of x, y, dy, dx. Or the, sorry, that should be dx, dy. Or the integral from a to b, the integral from c to d of f of x comma y dy dx. So these are going to turn out to be two ways of writing the same thing, only now it tells us how we actually would calculate this integral by hand. So suppose that a function f is a function of two variables on some rectangle. We're going to use the notation the integral from c to d of f of x, y, dy, to mean that this integral treats x as a constant. x is held fixed. And then f of x, y is integrated with respect to y only. And then you plug in the limits d and c and subtract. This is called partial integration, and it's very much like partial differentiation where we treat one of the variables as a constant. So notice this result will actually depend on x and all the y's will be eliminated because you're going to integrate with respect to y and then plug into the y's the limit. So this function is actually after you take the integral it only depends on x. If we now then integrate the function a the resulting a with respect to x from a to b. That is, we're going to integrate this a of x. Now, if you go back, a of x is this integral. So now the integral of a of x is going to be the integral of the integral. So the integral of an integral. The integral on the right-hand side is called an iterated integral. And usually we leave out the brackets. The way that I wrote it back on this slide here, I didn't put the brackets in, but all this means is you take the integral on the inside with respect to y, leaving a function of x. Then you take the integral of that function with respect to x, leaving you with a number. You can also do it in the opposite order, and we'll talk about how to do that in a second. But if I write it without the brackets, I just mean work from the inside out. So if we did switch the order, say we integrated first with respect to x, we would end up with a function of y inside. And then we take the integral with respect to y from c to d. And then you end up with a number. Notice that in both equations 8 and 9, we work from the inside out. So let's do an example so we can see this in practice. So if you don't see it right away, let's think in terms of the bracket right here. I want to do this integral first. So I'm going to leave the integral from 0 to 3 and a dx on the outside. And inside here, I want to actually take the integral of this function with respect to y. So you treat x squared as a constant. So the x squared just hangs out. And remember, when you have an integral of a constant times a function, you just keep the constant and integrate the function. Now the integral of y using the, the rule x to the n dx is x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 plus c. Remember I'm just going to add to this power of 1 so you get y squared over 2 and then you evaluate that from 1 to 2. That's your basic integral formula. So when I actually then plug in the limits, what I have is the integral from 0 to 3, x squared times 2 squared over 2, minus x squared times 1 squared over 2. I just plug in the limits, 2 and 1. So that's 4 over 2, which is 2. And this is 1 over 2, so that's one half. You get two x squared. That's a square there, sorry. Two x squared. 
minus 1 half x squared, which gives me a 3 halves x squared, which I integrate from 0 to 3 dx. Again, notice how when I integrated with respect to y, there's no y's left. Now what I do is I take the integral of this with respect to x, which gives me 3 halves x to the third over 3 from 0 to 3. Again, because I used the power rule, raise it one more power, divide by that higher power. The 3's cancel, so I get 3 cubed over 2 minus 0 cubed over 2, which is 27 halves. That's integrating from the inside out. Now let's do the same thing one more time, but all I do is I switch the integral order. So instead of integrating over y, where y goes from 1 to 2, and then x, where x goes from 0 to 3, I'm going to first do x, where x goes from 0 to 3, and then do y, as y goes from 1 to 2. So you integrate first inside with respect to x. Leave the outside alone, dy. The integral with respect to x, the y hangs out, so you get x cubed y over 3 from 0 to 3. x squared, the integral, is x cubed over 3. So now you plug in the 3 and the 0 into x. So you have the integral from 1 to 2 of 3 cubed y over 3 minus 0 cubed y over 3. This is 0. 3 cubed cancels, and I'm left with 9y because one of the threes cancels, and I'm left with 3 squared, which is 9. And this, then, I'm going to integrate from 1 to 2 dy. So we integrate. You get 9y squared over 2, because the integral of y is y squared over 2, from 1 to 2. That's 9 times 2 squared over 2 minus 9 times 1 squared over 2. So that's 9 halves. This is 18, because 9 times 2 squared over 2, one of the 2's cancels, you get 18 minus 9 halves. That's 36 over 2 minus 9 over 2, or 27 halves. So surprise, surprise, we get the same thing no matter which way we integrate. Which leads us to something called Fabini's theorem, which gives us a practical method for evaluating a double integral by expressing it as an iterated integral in either order. Fabini's theorem. Fubini's theorem. It's kind of like Clairaut's theorem. Clairaut's theorem said under certain conditions the order of partial differentiation didn't change the result. So is that same kind of idea true with um, integration and Fubini's theorem says yes it is. If f is continuous on a rectangle, r is the rectangle, x goes from a to b, y goes from c to d, then the double integral of f of x, y, dA is the integral from c to d of f of x, y, dy, then integral from a to b over dx. So integral from a to b, integral from c to d of f of x, y, dy, dx. Or you can switch the order. Do on the inside the x and on the outside the y. Notice how the limits always match. So inside the x's goes from a to b. On the outside over here, the x's go from a to b. And similarly, on the inside over here, y goes from c to d. On the outside, y goes from c to d. Okay, As long as f is continuous, that's all we need. Um, it's actually more generally true if we assume that f is bounded on r. If it's continuous at a finite number of smooth curves, it's still true. But generally, we are satisfied with the fact that it is continuous on the integral. We know if it's continuous on the integral, Fubini's theorem holds. 
So let's do a couple of different examples to explore why we might choose one order over another. Actually, I'm going to do just one example to show you how you might choose which one you're going to do. You don't have to do both. You can just choose one. Um, why would one be better than the other? Well, I'm skip that example. Let's do this one. We're going to evaluate the double integral over r of y times sine of x y. So if we first tried to integrate with respect to y, the problem is we have a y inside and a y outside, right? If I tried the integral of y sine of x y, that should not be a comma there, sorry. And I did inside y and outside dx. So if I'm doing the inside y here, that means the inside integral has to go from 0 to pi from here. And this says where my x's go from, so 1 to 2 on the outside. It could also be completely reversed and do y sine of x, y, dx, dy. And so my integral on the inside goes from 1 to 2, and the integral on the outside, 0 to pi. Fubini's theorem says these are the same. So mathematically, they're equivalent. But practically, I don't want to do the first one. Why? Because I have a y on the inside and a y on the outside. And the only way to integrate a function of y times a function of y that makes any sense here would be integration by parts. While I can do integration by parts, it's messy, especially when signs are involved. On the other hand, if I wanted to integrate with respect to x first, that becomes a whole lot easier. And it's easier because this y is just a constant, so I can ignore him. This y is just a constant, so I can ignore him. So I'm not going to do this one, but I am going to do this one. So I integrate from 0 to pi on the outside. And on the inside, I have to take the integral of y sine of xy. This would be like, for example, just thinking in my head what the integral of 2 sine of 2x would look like. That's not so hard to do. In fact, um, you can plug it into your calculator, into Wolfram Alpha, or you can use a, a u substitution where you let u equal xy, then du is y dx. You could replace that with u. Your y dx becomes du. And so you just have the integral of sine of u. The integral of sine of u is negative cosine of u, where u is xy from 1 to 2. So my claim is the antiderivative of y sine of xy is negative cosine of xy. Okay. You might pause the video and make sure you understand why that integral right there of y sine of xy, when you treat y as a constant and integrate over x, gives you this. And then I leave the outside integrals in place. Okay, so now plug in your limits. I get negative cosine of 2y minus a minus is plus cosine of y dy. So now I integrate each one of these separately. Um, the integral of cosine is sine. So I get negative sine of 2y. And I've got to divide that by 2 because of the chain rule. If I take the derivative of sine of 2y, I get 2 sine, sorry, 2 cosine of 2y. So I have to have a 2 on bottom to cancel that out. Uh, plus, and then the integral of cosine is sine y, and we do this from 0 to pi, which actually that gives me negative sine of 2 pi over 2 plus sine of pi minus negative sine of 2 times 0 over 2 plus sine of 0, All right, plugging in my top and my bottom limit. Sine of 2 pi is 0, 
sine of pi is 0, sine of 0 is 0, sine of 0 is 0. So the double integral there is 0. Now you are going to be allowed to use your calculator, which we'll talk a little bit about in class on Monday, of how to use your calculator to do these integrals inside here. But this one wasn't too bad.